I would like to introduce to you Sister Kay Johnson. She is a member, longtime member of this church. She's a historical society, probably been president, I'm not sure. And she's going to give us a little history. <coughs> Thank you, Barbara. It's good to see a lot of people I know. Some of you don't even know me, but I remember some of you. But you've changed. I mean, I haven't been in this church for 10 years. So some of you are looking a little old to me, and I'm looking as old and not older to you. you. You remember me when I was taller and bigger? So here I am, a shrunk 91 year old. But I remember, I remember. And that's what I'm here for, to tell a little bit about your church, uh, how it came to be. And then, of course, little, you can ask questions about Hudson, why we're having the 120, 150th anniversary tomorrow, particularly. It's all year, but they're going to celebrate more tomorrow. So um, speak to me later. Uh, remind me who you are, like someone just did a few minutes ago. She was in Sunday school when I was a teacher in Sunday school. Um, I was in the choir. I volunteered to be in the I suddenly had time on my hands, decided I could be in the choir. So I showed up one night, and the choir director was Edwina, Edwina Eastman. And she says, oh, you're in the wrong room. The board or the committee is meeting down there. I said, can I join the choir? Up until then, I had been teaching school at night. I couldn't be in the choir because I was teaching at Hudson High at night and at Astabat at night, four nights a week. So suddenly, I got a free night every week so I could be in the choir. I don't know if I could sing, but I could try, and I love to sing. And Bruna says, oh, yes, yeah, sure, be glad to have you in the choir. So I was in the choir every single Sunday. I don't think I ever missed a day, except in the summer when we were off anyway. That's 21 years. I, you don't believe that, do you, Edwina? I was there 21 years, every single Sunday. So I did choir with Edwina for quite a few years, and then we had John. And then we had other, now we have, who is it? The, new, the, new, the director for 10 years. Uh, so anyway, I gave, my husband was getting a new knee that week, was Thanksgiving week, which meant Christmas was coming up and a lot of extra rehearsals, a lot of more time spent on Sunday morning standing at attention. And my back fell, fell apart that day. Also, I, I ripped a, 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 a disc or something in my back. So it was a bad week. I had to stay home and take care of myself and my husband. And it was Thanksgiving week. So I uh, gave up the choir for Christmas. Uh, and with, uh, with, with Alan with a bad knee, he couldn't drive for six weeks or longer. So I was at home, and I got used to not coming to church, so I didn't come back. We, we together came to the church. They had a celebration of the people who had been here for 50 years or longer. So he and I did come to church one, once. That was quite a while ago now. Um, Alan was, came to Hudson when he was three years old. And now he's 94. So he's been around Hudson a long time. He's seen it grow from a little place to which is now 20,000 people. It's a good sized community. Um, of course, it was time for, uh, we finished high school, and it was time to go to college, time to go into World War II. And so after a while, we came back here together in 1955. We had already been married five years, so we decided to make Hudson our full-time home. We were expecting a first baby, and so we, and he's right here today. It was christened in September, 
60 years ago. He wouldn't want me to tell you that, but it was 60 years ago, and that he is 60 now. Um, so we came back to this church. So I think it's important to realize why did you, why did you pick this church? Maybe you were a Methodist from way back. Your grandmother or your mother or your father were a Methodist, so you came to, this Method, to a Methodist church. This happened to be the one in this community. Um, when I was growing up, we went to a little church was handy because my father worked on Sundays mostly and we had to walk. So I remember going to the Swedish Lutheran church in Brockton because it was only about a half a mile. And my sisters and I, us being four and six and eight, could walk to the Luther, Swedish Lutheran church. So we learned our catechism there and all the rules and things of church. I, we were in, I was in a, a pageant with a, a tinsel halo on my head for an angel at the, at the Christmas show. So we went to the Lutheran church for a few years. But if Dad comes home on Sunday, we would go down to Brockton to the uh, Baptist church. So when we moved to Lewiston, Maine, um, our next place, my father was an, an engineer for Hood Milk, and they kept moving him to every two or three years to wherever they were uh, needed him for building and expanding the uh, milk and ice cream business because he was uh, the, the mechanic, the engineer, to set up the new the new plant. Um, so we would get we got to Lewiston, Maine, and at that time my parents decided. My mother was a Methodist, my father, excuse me, was a Methodist because his great-grandfather was a Methodist minister. So we, he was used to that idea. So we went to the Methodist church up in Lewiston. It took, it was over a mile. And here were these three girls in the sixth, four, six, and eight grades walking to church. You didn't, weren't afraid to walk in those days. Nobody wanted to kidnap you. That meant one more uh, mouse to feed and one more child to care for. And it was in the 30s, so the money was scarce. You wouldn't want to take one more child on. So we walked to the Methodist Church over a mile each way and went back in the evening for the Girl Scouts. So, but it was poor church, didn't have much activity for three girls. So my mother decided the next time we go to a new community, we're going to pick a different church. So we moved um, to Wakefield, Massachusetts. And so happened that it was in very, very soon the 38 hurricane came through. 38 hurricane was very bad here in Hudson. The 38 hurricane took off two steeples of St. Michael's Church. They didn't put them back, they have a tower. They didn't put back those staples. But that was the 38th hurricane that destroyed them and lots of trees. So in, in Wakefield, Mass, the, again, the steeple was blown down and the roof blew away or else it was smashed by the, the chimney and the wind so that they weren't having any church there. They were renting a space to put the church to meet in. Mother decided, I told you, we're going to pick the biggest, best church we can find. For those three girls are going to be in high school, they need a, a youth group. So right in Wakefield Square is a big, white Baptist church. That's where we ended up. So we became Baptists. I didn't think it matters too much which church, Christian church, Protestant church. They're quite similar. Um, wherever you find a friend, you had a rally just this past weekend to encourage people to come to this church and get acquainted. And that's important. That's how you find a church, by your friends, your neighbors, and the community that you're in. And so that's why you had the rally. And it, it's a good idea to let that publicizing your uh, church to the community. So that is the reason that um, 
you might have just pick this church or some other church to go to. But what does Methodism mean? If you really, um, I don't think, even if you belong to this church, you know what Methodism is. Uh, what is the, why is the reason it's called Methodist Church? That's a funny name for a church. Uh, we have the Episcopal Church. You have the Federated Church, which is to be Baptist and Congregational. And you have Unitarian, lots of choices. Now we have street churches. They rent a space. And you, you rent space out or give space out to a Baptist, I mean a, a um, Brazilian church here. And that's wonderful that you are giving space that is not being used on late Sunday afternoon or some other time to another group of people who need a, a church, a place to meet and a place to worship. But it seems as though the storefront churches are doing better at this point. Their regular traditional churches are not doing as well. This church, uh, when we were in the 60s, was full, full of children, 150 every Sunday in Sunday school. And in the church, sometimes there would be two services, Easter and Christmas. So now we're all, I think of all of the straight line churches are pretty much quieted down. There's not as many people in any of the churches, um, it, which is sad. They don't take the time. Um, so we, it's important to promote your friendship and your, business, your openness, like tonight, to the community. So, what does Hudson Methodist mean? Um, I've got a lot of books in here. This particular book, Hudson's Heritage, was done by eighth graders in 1966, 100th year of Hudson. This is the 150th year, but in, in 1966, the 100th year. And their teacher in the eighth grade was Doris Roger. And she was in the Historical Society. Um, and she asked the, the students in the eighth grade if they would write a book about Hudson. So they each took a, a, a section of interest that they were interested in to write about, research and then write about it. And so these children now, we look back here, the Salmolas, remember the Salmolas? And the uh, Fieldsons, uh, Lucy Grace Sargent, but I forget the lady named Sargent that you have in church here. Um, Debbie Butcher, Tommy Fieldson, and Sarah Fieldson. So they each picked a part of what they thought was important to them for their history. And so Ronnie writes this, Ronnie Sear, C-Y-R. His parents were Wilma and, I can't remember, what? Lloyd. Lloyd, right, Wilma and Lloyd Sear. Um, Ronnie was their son. He is a minister. He works in, um, as a prison uh, advisor. Uh, mostly in the, the Mid-South. So he, he writes, the early Methodists started in this area, in the area of eight, in 1808, as a class under the leadership of Phineas Sawyer, the formation of a Methodist society in 1821. It grew from a class meeting to a society in 13 years. At first, there were just a few families, and then as the word got around, there would be a dozen or 15 families that would meet. Finally, they got to the point where they could afford a church building, and they built a brick church upon Gospel Hill. Maybe you know that name, Gospel Hill. Next to the, under, before you go down to the Julians, that peach orchard, that's Gospel Hill. And that was the first Methodist church. It served the people of Mar Marlboro. There wasn't any Hudson in that day anyway. It was Marlboro. They had served Sudbury and Gleasondale and Feltonville. There is a, a church in Gleasondale 
that was a Methodist church and the parsonage that we used for this church in Pleasendale for quite a few years. Um, so that was the beginning of um, the, the Methodist here. Methodist met in the first in a few homes and then in the village there might only be four or five homes but then they might find other people by a mile away who could walk and come to a service. And so these Methodist preachers were called circuit riders because they, they established um, families, homes where they could meet. And they had a circuit. They, had a, a, they would go maybe a dozen homes Every week they would, or every two weeks they would go to the same homes, and they called it a circuit, or a route, or a, a cul-de-sac. We would call it perhaps, but they were called the circuit riders, and that was how Methodist preaching was started. And then as it, that they grew into bigger groups, they needed to perhaps have a, a meeting house. But they made, they made it in a living room or in, a, a, in a, an outside room. Um, and you, the um, circuit rider, the minister, was invited to stay overnight. He had to sleep somewhere. They didn't have bees and bees in those days. So you slept there at the house and they had a meal for you. They would pass the plate. People might put in a few pennies or a dollar. A nickel, and there wasn't much money for anybody, and they, there was no way to make any money because they were all farmers. They all had you had to be a farmer to eat and uh, have your family. You raised your own vegetables, your chicken, uh, your pig, your lamb. You raised it for yourself. <laughs> so I have more information about that because. I told you my great-grandfather was a Methodist minister. This is the story of him, Hugh Montgomery. He was a circuit rider. He tells, in working out of Bellows Falls, Vermont, he tells each house that he goes to see. Um, he was writing to his girlfriend. He was 30 years old, and he was writing to his girlfriend, a daughter of one of the local farmers, and he would say what he was preaching on that day and what Bible verse he was using. And he would even explain to her how much the take was for that night if he made $2 or something. That was the only income he would have. He didn't need much because someone always was feeding him and letting him sleep over anyway. So this book here I've enjoyed reading, my great-grandfather. This was, this was in like 1860 that he was a minister doing this uh, circuit riding. So the Methodists believed in free will. They didn't have a regime required by the, a, a pope or uh, the hierarchy of a church. There was more of a free society. So they emphasized personal and social responsibility. In the early 1700s, John Wesley and Charles Wesley started this movement, this idea, at Oxford University. And uh, they were, the early 18th century, evangelistic teachings of John and Charles. Charles Wesley liked to write poems and he did about a thousand hymns. His poems are put to music, and over a thousand hymns are related to Charles Wesley. And um, so they, they had a methodical way of learning and studying and worshiping. They stressed free will as opposed to the Calvinistic predestination. <clears throat> So, of course, now it's a huge movement. The Methodists started out small with only, Charles and John Wesley were 
a family uh, in Northern Isle in, in England. Susanna was the mother. I was asked by the women's group here a long time ago to bring up, up a program of Susanna Wesley. The book you can order through the library of, of the life of Susanna Wesley, their mother. She had 17 children. How you went to school in those days, there were no schools. But your mother and father taught you. And that's how they passed on the learning and the reading uh, by the mother and father. If there were 17 children, there were always a few at the top that could help the younger ones with their numbers and their reading. I can imagine sitting down to a meal and having, every meal would be a turkey. <laughs> I don't think they even had a turkey. Every meal would be um, mush, biscuits, um, corn pudding, like, like our a, uh, Indian pudding that we make. So 17 children, she would assign each child an hour a week to visit with her and talk with her. Because how do you talk to your children when there are so many? She would, of course, see them at mealtime around the house, but there would be a, a sign, an appointment to visit with mother so they could tell her their tr her troubles or ask for uh, forgiveness ask for assistance. Um, so they were, each child was given a special time, which they looked forward to, because this is, well, would be your private time with your parents. Um, John Wesley was one of the, like, like the, not the 12th one or so, one of the younger ones. And there was a fire in the house, because he had open fires, or open fireplace to cook on. So the whole house caught fire one day, and he evidently rushed back in the house, the house to get something, and he was severely burned. But he got through it, he lived through it, and this helped him to understand uh, pain and suffering, which helped him a great deal through his ministry. <coughs> So Phineas Sawyer was the first one we know of coming to this um, town. And he, the, uh, first of all, at, at, when there were 20 families in a community, they're required to get a minister, to not have a church, but have a minister. So each person is taxed uh, to supply this minister. So there were, uh, in 1660, there were 38 families in this area so that they were required to have a minister. So anyway, back in, in 1808, Phineas Sawyer bought a piece of land which comprised of many, many acres and a, um, a mill, like the Wayside Inn, the round uh, water wheel. That was what attracted a lot of people to come live in Hudson, was the water, the river going through it. The river water is needed for life. For, for, for water. We know that we need water for our gardens, we need water for our cisterns to provide water uh, for our wells, and they needed water. the water could be used for power. So it was harnessed up in it with a water wheel to make power. <clears throat> uh, so Mr. Sawyer was a Methodist. He was converted into the ministry by Reverend George Pickering in 1798. He held religious meetings in his house, also in the factory. He had a, there was a marble satinette factory. They made fabric, um, like a, a satin, but it was made of cotton and wool, but nice fine 
uh, warm, warm and thick, but it was fine piece of, of uh, weaving. So he was able to buy a piece of land uh, that included this mill. The corn mill was to be the, the place of his death in the sepulchre. In January 1820, he went under the mill to cut away the ice that clogged the water wheel. The wheel suddenly started. He was caught in the swirl and lost his life. You know that wheel, big wheel over to the wayside inn? Covered with ice and frozen stiff and, and quiet. But he was under there chopping the ice when it started and he was caught and went into the icy water and the, into the wheel. So he was killed there. He was only 30 or so years old. They found him later. So that's a, a sideline on, on Phineas Sawyer. Um, then we go on to the next person who was really instrumental in Methodism in Hudson was Stratton, Viola Stratton. She's, her great-grandfather was Daniel Stratton, or maybe a great-great-grandfather, two or three greats, was uh, her, you know, Stratton Hill, the houses, a hundred houses on Stratton Hill. That was around the farm of Daniel Stratton was the beginning of shoe business in Hudson. He sold out to his son Lorenzo, and Lorenzo uh, was actually in, in the, if you remember where Haynes, uh, which her, Mrs. Haynes lived on the corner of Russell Street near Barbara's house and, uh, and Lincoln Street, that house there uh, is where Mrs. Haynes, what, what was what's her first name? Norma. She was a librarian. Norma. And anyway, that's where Lorenzo made shoes in his backyard in the shed there. They're made by hand in those days, all stitched by hand. They didn't have any power, power machines. The, the sewing machine hadn't been invented yet for them to use. So they put them together with hand stitching which you could, uh, men took the work home at night so they could keep on sewing at home and make an extra pair, an extra dollar is what it amounted to, that they could take. They, so they made um, shoes by hand all day into the evening until it was dark and they couldn't do any more. So that was Lorenzo Stratton and his father was Daniel Stratton and they lived up on Stratton Hill there's a Stratton house there now, not the original one that one burned and it's been was replaced. So um, up on Gospel Hill was the first Methodist church. And they served the people in Gleasendale and people from Marlborough. People went out of their way to find the right church in those days. <coughs> Um, so that finally they had enough money and enough people to start a bigger new church. And they did open a new church in 1866 when this town was incorporated, 1866, they built their new church. Where Obershawn's was, now it's a beer uh, establishment. They make beer down there now, but it was a beautiful big church, big one. Let's see, I got pictures that we can pass around. We don't have a video aboard, so we brought pictures that you can share as we pass them around. This church, the Methodist Church was right opposite the Unitarian Church. So can pass a few of those, please. Yeah. 
And you can see that it was a, just a beautiful, huge place in 1866. With, um, so they continued to, to, to work there until February 28, 1911. There was a fire that burnt up the church. Well, it was uh, past a few on that side of the room. Um, on Saturday, that particular day, a dear boy lady had been practicing the organ, the organ, and she was a daughter of the dear boy. Upstairs, the beautiful stained glass window over the altar is in honor of Benjamin Dearborn. It was put up there long, long after Benjamin Dearborn died about 1900, and that was put in honor of him, Benjamin Dearborn. He had nine daughters, and one of them was the, the organist for the Methodist Church. So she was in there on Saturday, and everything was fine. I remember we went to the Baptist Church we went to in Wakefield was a huge room like this with a big boiler in one corner, big round boiler for a lot of wood or a lot of coal. And eventually, of course, it could be made into oil. So the, the church caught fire. I mean, the whole thing is such a mess. That beautiful church, which cost, I think, 40000 You can imagine the feeling you would have if you found out that this church, or any, any church, was burnt right to the ground. So this church was by, all burnt up. Um, February 28th, 1911. I was told that uh, over the years that these pointed windows were saved and re reused up in, in uh, Thomas Taylor building. But I went by it yesterday and then those windows are not in it. I think the whole thing has been redone with new siding and new windows, square windows, lots of windows. But I was, I all these years believed that these pointed windows were up there in that building. Maybe they were, but they've been boarded up over, and there's lots of windows up there. So here's more pictures of the, of the burnt-up church. So what do you do when your church is demolished? Suddenly, you wake up, and your neighbors tell you, oh, the church is gone. It's gone. And so it's a terrible feeling. The church that you have served in so many Suppers in, painted, you have painted and worked so hard to help maintain. So what do we do for a church then? So Mr. Across the way here, you have the brick mansion of L.T. Jeffs, J-E-F-T-S, this brick mansion across here. This land you're sitting on here was Mr. Jeff's land. That little island out in front of the church, where you can park on either side, was Mrs. Jeff's rose garden. So she used, this is probably a vegetable garden or uh, whatever they might have. But this land was given by Mr. Jeff's to make this uh, church here. They were looking, of course, for a place to put the church. They would have a parking lot. 1911, we're beginning to get a few cars. We're thinking ahead that you know, in the future of this area, there will be cars, more cars. So we needed a place for a, a parking lot. So that when you selected, that's one thing that the Unitarian Church does not have, uh, nor the Episcopal Church. Where do they park? On the streets or quite a ways away to walk to it. So they needed a place for the parking lot. and. They built this beautiful uh, Tudor church. The style is stucco with the wood trimming 
and uh, called Tudor, T-U-D-O-R, an English style Tudor church. There is a steeple, but you can't find it. I didn't know there was a steeple. So after I read that there was one, I went out there to look in there. I'm not sure that it's whole and good. The tower is what has a cowl on. I doubt if it used, it's used, maintained to be used now. But there was a cowl on it. You could operate from the organ. Uh, it's a beautiful church. And the inside of the church, of course, you know, is because of the, of the beautiful wood. Um, yeah. Makes a beautiful church. You don't need decorations. You have all that lovely wood up there. So you can pass a few of these along. Here, Mark. I think that's a beautiful, the beautiful window upstairs has been lit on the outside by a granddaughter, Mildred Brigham, I believe, uh, was the granddaughter. Her mother was one of the um, Benjamin Dearborn nine daughters. She lived in the, uh, in the, the senior center over here. The Mrs. Brigham there was another daughter of Benjamin Dearborn. So that there were nine, nine daughters. I think one of them did not live to be an adult, but the others all did. So um, they have, they're around, around here. So. so I wanted to add also to something my mother mentioned about one of the families from, from my days here. Uh, those of you who were here in the 60s and 70s, and I've seen a few of you. But mother mentioned the Sear family. And both of the sons of the Sear family who grew up in this church became ministers. Uh, the late Ron Sear, I believe, got his divinity degree at Duke University, and he may have been a Methodist pastor. I'm not positive what denomination Ron was in. He did pass away a few years ago. Jim Sear was a classmate of mine. I met in this building when we were five years old in Methodist uh, kindergarten together, and we went all through school together. Uh, Jim also became a pastor. He doesn't work full-time as a pastor. He does have a, a part-time practice as a pastor. He works for uh, a social services agency in New Jersey doing crisis intervention with youth. He really has a fascinating career. But what I also wanted to mention about Jim is that he's a Christian storyteller. And he has some really good stuff on YouTube. Uh, he's a very skilled uh, Christian storyteller and uh, sort of an avocation for him. I'm sure he would make a living at that if he could. but. Um, uh, if you look him up on, on Facebook, uh, I, I can't remember the ex exact, I believe he goes by Heart Tales, but you just look up Jim Sear, C-Y-R. He does, he does some, some marvelous uh, stories that he produces the video right in his home and some, uh, you know, some Bible figures uh, you'll, you'll recognize. Uh, he does a really a nice job and he's still a friend of mine. We, we see each other a couple times a year and I, I know some of you. You know, remember him, so I wanted to mention that, and it's good to see you know people that I yeah. I knew back in the day, and you know I rec I recognized Pam a second I walked in this hall, and you know I practically grew up in this hall. You know, uh, one way to get the perfect attendance record in Sunday school is for your mother to be the superintendent of Sunday school. So, <laughs> so I did that here. We had big. I told you, with so many children, we had a, a good youth group, <clears throat> high school youth group. And when he was in, high, in the youth group, I think about six of those kids either became ministers or married ministers. Timmy, Timmy Otto? She married a pastor. Then what was the one who married the Episcopal? She was not from our church, but to the Federated Church, but they came here as high schoolers to be in our youth group. And we had, let's say, a, almost a half a dozen that became ministers or married ministers. It was just an amazing time with 100, you can imagine 150 kids on Sunday morning here. We had uh, two, three teachers, two grades, two grades to a room, and three teachers so that you could have a Sunday off once every month. <clears throat> and uh, we used the Methodist books, the Coke spray books, um, we had like 30 kids in each class. <laughs>